Coming to you from the all-new Live House in Hollywood, California. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Place. In just a second, you're going to meet two of the hottest songwriter and producers in the country. But first, we've got the first winners of the Warm Summer Giveaway. They are from London, Catherine O'Neill, from Vancouver, Chris Potter, and from San Diego, Matt Fowler. Congratulations to you all. Each of you will get one of these great Warm Mic products for them to choose from, and they all have that Bryce Young warm quality to it. And for the rest of you on the planet, hurry up and enter. Three winners each week for the next three weeks. How do you do it? Pretty simple. Head to warmaudio.com forward slash warm hyphen summer hyphen giveaway. That's warmaudio.com forward slash warm hyphen summer hyphen giveaway. Enter all the information and look to win. Uh, and if you would, sign up for our newsletter for more news you can use and do us the honor of liking, subscribing, and clicking notify. We appreciate you for that. As we said at the top, Luke Laird and Ross Copperman are two of the hottest songwriter producers in the country. Astounding number of hits, awards, and accolades. Uh, during our meet and greet, Luke was actually getting hit by Luke Bryan's manager and sharing those texts with me about working with him. That's how hot they are. That was on a Saturday afternoon. We recently sat down with them and Beth Laird, super executive and Luke's wife, for a great conversation. We hope you enjoy it. One of the things that I've noticed is, is that collaboration is very key in both your creative processes. Oftentimes you've collaborated with some of the same people and then you have other sort of favorites. Talk about how collaboration works for each one of you individually. I always feel like uh, Nashville is the best at this and when you when you could compare, when you pair up somebody that's good at one thing and another person's good at another thing and then maybe one other and you, you create the perfect little mix. So, so one person's really good at doing tracks, another person's really good at top lining lyrics and then maybe you have a really good singer and the three of those I feel like that that makes the perfect like Luke, hit uh, do you prefer to start with a with a blank slate or, or with a collaborator with an idea um, do you I, like to be the one bringing the idea first or do you like to be the one or is there any pattern to it I mean honestly I I try to always have and I I know Ross is the same way like a lot of people we started out just writing songs by ourselves um, I try to always have some ideas, whether it's titles or lyrical ideas or little, you know, eight bar track starts. Um, I think it's good, especially nowadays, where you may be, you may really excel at one, one thing more than the other. But nowadays, if you can be more diverse in, in the skill set that you bring, I think that that's going to, that's going to, you know, hopefully give you a longer career. Just describe what an eight bar track start is. Um, I just said eight bar, like just, I mean, literally if it's just a drum loop and like a guitar riff, a lot of times we're working with artists and nowadays they want to hear something immediately that sounds like they can envision themselves on a, on the radio or in a stadium singing somewhere. So, and then some artists don't, don't want you to have any track, just want, you know, to start with a guitar or just a piano vocal. So. I think with what we do, it's good to just kind of be, do your homework and know who you're going to be working with that day, right. but also be prepared to, to bring all the tools out. Do you, do you ever think about pushing your own skill set by collaborating with people that people would be surprised that you collaborate with, stepping outside a genre? <clears throat> Is that something that's interesting to do or, or that you do do? I mean, for me, yes. I, I obviously being in Nashville, I moved here because I love country music, but I also love all different kinds of music. And there's a lot of people out there that are way more talented than me that I can. I mean, every every day there's new people moving to town that I learn cool things from. Yeah. Um, yeah Luke, hey, Luke, you said that you would really, 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 really love to do a to have Snoop and uh, Busta Rhymes rap over one of your beats. Is that yeah. still your goal in life? Yeah. Well, I have had Snoop on one of them. Uh oh. Which I actually have a song with Snoop, and I got Casey Musgraves to sing the hook, but it's been unreleased, so it's just sitting on my hard drive. But does the song? I, you know, it, all the business stuff has had to had, would have to fall. I mean, it'll probably just be something I enjoy. Does the file smell a certain way? Does it have a certain? It it has a certain scent to it, and. Okay. Um, 
I, yeah, I, 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 hopefully I can still open the session. But if not, you'll have fun trying. <laughs> Session's really disorganized. Yeah, it's like, there, nothing is labeled. It opens, on, four, it opens labeled. on 420 by itself, you know. Uh, Just and, dollar signs on every track. Exactly. Yeah. Ross, you're a, you're a rocker guy, right, originally? Yeah. That, yeah. That was, and so when you think about your influences now, is it a wide range, a narrow range? Is it only rock and country? Where where does it where does it emanate from? Yeah, I, I grew up listening to '90s rock, and that's that was my youth. And um, I my mom only played the Beatles in the car, and the Stones, and Led Zeppelin, and so that's kind of what I came from. And I feel like, you know, there's a lot of um, people like me in Nashville now writing country songs, and so that influence has has worked its way into the genre. And that, I mean, country music almost needs subgenres now. There's so many different things. I mean, now you have Blanco Brown and the Get Up and Lil Nas X. These are like subgenres within the the format, and it's just so wide open now, which is a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, Americana is almost like actual country music. Right. Now, right. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And and Beth, you as somebody who is overseeing publishing and management selecting this kind of talent with subgenres, with different interests and so on and so forth. Is it a combination of a formula? Is it your gut? Is it both? Is it just your ears? What's the selection process that you go through? So when Luke and I started Creative Nation, we kind of, we jumped out and took a risk. I was a rep at BMI. Um, and actually I met Ross when he was coming to town, like right before he moved to Nashville. And that was what was so cool about my job being a rep at BMI. I got to meet all these like great, really talented writers and artists really early on. Luke had been writing for a long time at a company. And so when we took this risk to create Creative Nation, we, we jumped out and we just wanted to create an environment we wanted to work for. So we had three rules. Number one is no assholes. You have to work with enough in the business. We don't want them in our company. Number two, you have to have, your talent has to be, we have to be so passionate about your talent that if everyone in town passes and no one else is interested, we don't care because we just passionately believe that much. And then number three is you have to want to have coffee with them every morning. It's hard to have all three of those rules. So honestly, that plays a lot into it for us personally, but we also like to have different lanes. So. Well, real quick, Ross actually has all three of those qualities. He just costs too much money. So True. that's why we don't work together. True. Well, we do work together for free. Uh, but, you know, at a lot of companies, if you have like 100 songwriters, you would sign 10 of the same type. And it's kind of like whoever works you drop the rest and focus on one. But we just aren't created that way. So we like to really bet on one person in each lane that we feel like can all collaborate, work together, have mutual respect. And that way everybody feels like they're confident in what they do and they're not worried inside our building who else is in there. So a lot of times it's referrals. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's just us seeing people, but we really get together with our whole team and decide. I would say at the end of the day, honestly, it's gut. It's not based, because we've signed a lot of people that wouldn't have followers or streams or success. I don't, I, I mean, that's great, but I think for us, it's really, is there something in the way that you write it? Do you have a unique voice we've never heard before? And is there a skill set you have that we feel like we don't have that would really blend and you're a type of person who wants to be competitive and learn and collaborative and all those kinds of things? You said, so, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So for the sake of you guys, just so we can break down the room, how many songwriters out there? How many producers, artists, engineers, uh, people who want to be executives? I see you back in the back. Good, 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 good. So these are great lessons for all of you to take and figure out how it works into what you're doing. Have a unique voice. Be good to be around. Beth and I were talking backstage about soft skills, how you listen how you wear on people. How, if you're gonna be in a creative space, you can't be toxic. You'd be surprised at how much that is important as much as your technical skills. It's your human skills that become important. Listen to your creativity. Guess what? Your creativity is not in your phone. Put your head up. 
have a conversation with somebody, use your ears, use your gut. So these are the kinds of things that sometimes you hear us harp on the show, but it's even more important when you hear how successful it's made these folks. These, these happen to also be really good people. They haven't lost who their humanity. As fact, Beth, I think for you and Luke, Creative Nation feels like a home, a company run by a family, and it, it's got a boutique kind of style, and it feels, I mean, I think Lori McKenna said, she used to hang out there anyway, so it made complete sense to her to sign there because it felt comfortable. Was that by design? Yes. I mean, we can. you can talk about it from the creative side, but one thing that we did when we have a house, we have two houses on Music Row as our office, and one thing I saw in other companies that bugged me is that if we don't have a creative environment where songwriters and producers and artists feel creative and can create, then I don't, I don't have a job. And what happens sometimes is I think the business comes first and then the creative and songwriters are an afterthought. And I see how that happens because they're all together in offices every day. But the reality is I don't have a job if I can't help spur creative people and help them have creative ideas. So I think when we first started, one of the things that I told Luke and that we talked about, and, and when we were looking at our money and setting aside money to do this, it was like, I know there's not a real return on investment for an uh, office, and we could probably figure this out without an office, but I think creating an office where people want to come and hang out and collaborate will actually create an environment that attracts creative people and we will get songs that will create money but it's hard for people to see that in the beginning and that's what started happening i mean honestly like we're known for our snacks and our coffee and our real creamer i know that sounds funny but it's true and so artists want to come back and hang out there and whoever's hanging out around the coffee pot meets other people around the coffee pot and if luke's riding with Casey Musgraves that day, for instance, then our new writer who's in there is hanging out with her as well. And so it creates this thing that I, I don't know how to explain it, but if you're creative, you get it. Hey, Ross. I said yeah. Ross and you got an applause. Damn, that's they, huge. They applauded what you said from way over there. <laughs> so, Ross, um, uh, people writing, are lucky to get snacks at my studio, by the way. I, oh. I like popcorn <laughs> occasionally. So, uh, the book, Writing Better Lyrics by Pat Patterson. Um, there's a story behind that. You want to tell it or you want me to embarrass you? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, when I was maybe 18 years old, I went to a John Mayer show in my hometown in Virginia. And I creepily stalked him back to, to a restaurant after the show. Saw him in the restaurant, kind of went up to his table. I was like, John, I'm your biggest fan in the world. And he said, I, I don't want to say he said, he said something very crude, actually. Kind of embarrassing, but then he said, you want to come sit down and have a drink? And so I did, and um, he told me to buy this book called Writing Better Lyrics by Pat Patterson, which was one of his professors at Berkeley. And that book really changed my life. It just kind of, it kind of goes through and just shows you how to, how to, how to get better. And I've always, since that day, just focused on trying to, to improve and become better. And um, I just, I just ran into John actually last year at the Grammys and told him that I bought that book and how it changed my life. And he said he reads it every year, still, once a year to this day. So along that line, because you went to MTSU, education for folks, an important component of your journey for both of you creatively? I, I mean, yeah, for both of us. Now I will say, like I moved here to be a songwriter. I'm fully aware you don't have to have a college degree to be a songwriter. And honestly, if I would have got offered a publishing deal before I graduated, I probably would have dropped out of school. But, but I, but looking back, I'm very grateful for that experience because I did learn a, a lot about the business side of things. Um, and and I honestly, just just having that college experience for the type of music I write, I, I reflect on those. Sure those days so much in my in my writing so is this a fair cool. oh sorry go ahead no no uh, <coughs> shotgunning beers state? shotgunning beers and like well you know it's <laughs> interesting because i was going to say education is not always school yeah it can be life experiences it can so be true. work it can be success it can be failure but uh, see if this is true since you all are amongst the best what we find on the show is that people that sit to dave and i's left every week for all these number of years 
the best are always curious. For sure. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, I mean, and I don't think it even is like they're the exceptions to have gone to school as songwriters, but I think realistically, like you're saying, experience, social experience and interaction is so key. And um, it, it doesn't necessarily even have to be college learning. Yeah. Like I love, like I'm always reading business books and I've always going to conferences and workshops. And I think what you're saying about being curious, they both started just as songwriters playing on guitar. Yeah. And now both of them self-taught how to produce and are producing, you know, major records off of they just really learning and being curious. I mean, I honestly don't even hardly watch TV anymore. I, I literally watch 20 year olds making beats on YouTube. I mean, that's how I, I, it's wow. funny. Obviously, we watch your stuff, but I'm, I'm, I'm so curious of Thanks for the shout out. creative process. I got, a, you know? I got a question for both of you guys in that vein. So Old Town Road, Little Nas X. Um, I know you're going to like it because you like hip hop beats. Can, can you give me an opinion, Beth and, and Ross, in a, a one or two sentence opinion about that song? About It started out as a country song and got kicked off the charts by Billboard. Well, let me say, um, I honestly don't have an, a, a necessarily an opinion on whether it's country or not, because to me it sounds countryer than some of the song that's some of the songs that are on country radio. But I yeah, also, true. you know, maybe because it wasn't technically a country artist, I see why people are upset. But for me, the first time I heard that song, I was kind of like, and somebody told me about it. Have you heard this? And I listened to it, and I was just kind of like, I was like, it's kind of whatever. But then probably because I heard it a zillion times. I was like, oh, it's kind of growing on me. And then one night we were down at the uh, CMA Fest at the stadium show and he came out and started playing that. And I mean, I felt what everybody else, did. you know, you just got <laughs> swept up. You couldn't, yeah. it'd be like if Def Leppard came out there and played Pour Some Sugar on me. I mean, it was crazy. And then Keith Urban was playing the banjo. I was like, this, this is like, one. I wish I wrote this song so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Trent Reznor did write the song. He did, yeah. Which he, not many people realize. Yeah, he, yeah it was an the they sampled the off a, his, a record it? from 2008. Oh, you know this. I've always wanted to know the story. So it's a it's off a Nine Inch Nails record that was came out off of Ghosts in 2008. Stop it's just an it. instrumental. So you know Trent no, Reznor's like, it's like it's all of a sudden true. like, what is it? You know, 11 years later, well, I'll take a piece of yeah, that song. 15 weeks or 16 weeks now at number oh. one. So it's that's the perfect song. I mean, if there's something about it, it's just perfection. It Do you clearly, wish you'd written it? Absolutely. But I was the same as Luke first <laughs> I time I heard it. it. Beth wish she'd written and it. And a lot of country artists aren't happy about it because yeah. this is guy that just dropped a track in his bedroom, really, mm -hmm. and he's crushing all, everybody. Just but like, this, this is where... And now the get-up is right behind it. Another, yeah. You look at the top three, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, it's like... But this is where the apex, which is important to all you guys and everybody watching... Yeah. Things are always moving and evolving. Oh, yeah. Technology and music and cultural mores, they cross paths. And there's opportunity when those paths cross That's right. to step in and do the thing that hasn't been done. Yes. And all of a sudden it turns into I think something somebody amazing. in their bedroom has a, is as much of an opportunity as a hit Absolutely. as like anybody on Music Row or in L.A. Does, like. Well, and I'll say for Ross and I, I know he's such a music connoisseur too, but for me, um, just... And, you know, I hope to be relevant for years to come. But one thing I tell people is once you get into the business side of things, do all that, don't forget to be a fan. And like we're so close to so many of these songs, it's easy. Like if somebody else gets a song on the radio, you can be like, uh, like you literally know everybody working on everything. So but you got to really try to take yourself out and just listen to it. Just always stay a fan. And that'll I think you have a lot better chance at be staying relevant because if you're just one of these people who like i hate everything that's coming out well then it's going to be hard really hard to work in the business also yeah. can uh, i just uh, say about yeah, sure. you were just talking about this when things change i think a lot of times when writers come into the business they try to chase what's on the radio and i would say like what i hear coming out of writers like luke and ross and writers i'm around every day is once it's on the radio you know that was usually one to five years ago yep. created so yep. you have to think about what is next if you can listen to what's happening on the radio that's what's popular now so what's coming next is going to be different than that so a lot of times when i would meet with writers at bmi 
I would be like, don't be a knockoff version of someone else. They're always going to do the best of that. And they're going to get that cut every time because they're better than you. But if you're totally different and Keith Urban, which he's a great example because he does a lot of, tries a lot of different things. If he says, you know what, I'm feeling like I need some new stuff in the mix. He's not going to pick off the, he's not going to pick the knockoff version. He's going to go, that is really different. That's really unique. Who is that? And you have a better shot that way. And I think a lot of times people just keep trying to play to the middle but you will stand out. It might take longer, but then you could literally change what music is. Be yeah. fearless. Yeah. Be fearless. Don't be, don't be afraid yeah. to step out. Look, I speak from example. You got two old dudes who decide to become internet quasi stars in a, in their. You 50s. guys are you guys are uh, you know social media influencers now. Yeah. Yeah. And and when we started yeah. this, we, got the we didn't ARP have award. any idea of what it could be. And it morphed and changed, and we just kept changing with it. We stayed curious, and here we are. You know, a, almost a decade later, with something that's been really interesting. The the going to your producer side and your songwriter side. Do you guys feel like you have signatures? Is there a Ross Copperman signature or a Luke Laird signature, or maybe that there isn't? I mean, Ross's signature is just he just does hits. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a strive I for that, get signature. that signature. Yeah, I do too, actually. Uh, I do think he has a style. Like, I think people do come to Ross because he's a good collaborator and he can do a lot, but they also come for a style. Then I think the same thing about Luke. I mean, yeah. that and, and other um, producers too, like each producer has a little something that is their style, and right. that's why an artist would be attracted to it. Yeah. Right. Looking for a certain type of song. If you're looking for like an upbeat, fun kind of track you'd go to probably go to luke okay if you're looking for like broody emo eve sub vibe come to me gotcha when we're talking about you know sharing with the audience standing out and having a signature and not being a knockoff and so on and so forth it, it's not necessarily that you try for it consciously you let it evolve to that and you have to evaluate it in such a way where you go no i can push the envelope farther or no i'm playing too safe and you become your own measuring stick on how to grow but oftentimes when you think it's the like we've had so many people on the show tell us that the mistake that was in the production turned out to be the hook yeah. that that everybody grabbed onto, or it turned out to be something so you have to know not to get rid of that mistake right you, yeah it, it always happens happen when the talk back is on and gets recorded <laughs> you're like wow how did we get that sound and i always uh, justin ebag mixes a lot of my records oh and yeah i'm usually like Recording guitars, like direct in acoustic guitars, like just the most terrible sounding thing ever. And he's always like, man, that was so cool. That guitar sound you got I'm like you would not have liked to see how it happened. <laughs> hey, I had Keith Urban ask me how I got a guitar sound. I said, you don't want to know. <laughs> this is, you know, a guy who plays a two hundred fifty thousand dollar Les Paul right. through the vintage amp. Yeah. And I said, do you really want to know? And I said it was that Mexican Telecaster. <laughs> Now, get ready. Pull up the amp simulator in Logic, and it was this preset. He was like, no <laughs> way, and I said, I promise. There Ross, you go. That's how we roll. There hey, you go. Ross, what's your, uh, what's your favorite Luke song? Um, that's tough. <laughs> Hillbilly he Bone. He doesn't like my song. <laughs> Hillbilly Bone, ba bone ba bone Blake bone. Shelton. <laughs> yeah. Ross, that's very kind of you, buddy. How did that come about? That song was... Um, Gosh, that's like 10 years ago now. Um, Sorry, that's not actually my favorite. My favorite, you heard of, is it American Girl? American Kid? I wish I wrote American Girl. No, what's the early carry? What, some of your early carry Underwood songs oh, are my so favorite. So Small? So Small. Woo! Yeah, because yeah that those, was my those first. are the songs that I like fell in love with country music, listening to Luke. That was my first um, song I ever heard on the radio. I wrote with Carrie Underwood and Hillary Lindsay. Probably one of your favorite songs. That yeah, that I've that I've been a part of for sure. Yeah. Um, what do you like of his? My favorite rock. I mean, he. For those of you, you guys, a lot of you probably know this, but Ross is, in the last few years, he's had so many hits. I mean, I literally cannot keep up, but I do love John Cougar, John Deere, and John Three Sixteen. Oh, yeah, I like. And that I never, too. I would love to hear how you guys demoed that. But um, first of all, just lyrically, it's really clever and just super fun. Musically, but I love how Keith did the just the bass in it. 
Because when that ca- that song first came on the radio, it to me it didn't sound like anything else. Yeah. At, at the time, and I feel like you do that a lot. For both of you who are family people, I think that work-life balance helps creativity, and I think too many of people, who, too many people who are trying to get there, miss that part of it, because the technology allows you to do it 24/7. You can do it from your home. You can do whatever. Yeah. Is work-life balance important, Beth, Luke, Ross? What do you, what do you? What I mean, you, I, all, you know, everybody's different, but for me, it's it's very important because I, I mean, I I'm so passionate about music and I, I love it so much, and and I could easily always find something else to do or get lost in another thing, but I've found, um, yeah, having that balance actually helps my creativity, and it is nice to. I think it's probably one reason I don't have a studio at the house. It's just nice to be able to turn it off and come back with a fresh perspective. Um, but as as much as I love, this is che- sounds cheesy, music and that, I actually love my wife and my kids more. So and yeah. but and that's not always easy to do. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm just kidding. The reason that I went after this panel in terms of I didn't want it to just be creative. So you could see now that you have tools where you can do it yourself. Now you have to do the other part. Just because you have the tools, if you don't know what to do with the tools, you're just sitting there kind of looking stupid. And and you don't even know why you're looking stupid. You're going through YouTube trying to figure out who does what. So it's important to know that these processes, the more you give, the more you have to do with what you give. And so you can get it done, as these people have gotten it done, as we've gotten it done, but it's 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 chess, it ain't checkers. You know what I mean? Is that is that fair to say? How, give give um, them give them some advice. How would somebody, for instance, get on your radar, Beth? Is it a song that blows you away? Is it how how does the process work? I, I mean, I think you can get on the radar in lots of different ways. Like we sign, you know, we sign one artist based upon hearing a song on a Spotify playlist that they had never even been programmed on a sponsored playlist. They uploaded something and it started doing really well. And Luke was driving into work and then walked right in my office. and was like, you need to listen to this. That's one way we heard it. Another way is a friend will call me. One thing that's really great is when writers within my building start talking about someone or um, people I've hired on the creative side are out and about and they're like, there's something interesting here you need to pay attention to. So if you're out and about and you're working and you're putting your music out and you're growing and I mean, usually if it's really great and really unique, it will start connecting and doors will start opening and people will hear, hear about it. If someone sends a, an email or a, a, an old school mail with a, a song, would you open it and listen to it? I mean, honestly, that's really hard because now we're in this weird time with songwriters. Seriously. And I think that it's kind of sad because when I was at BMI, on, I was there for five years. I looked at it. On average, I met with one new person a day. So I listen to new stuff all the time. But now in the position we're in, like songwriters are actually have uh, copyright insurance and they're getting sued. And so we have to be really careful about what we accept. And I would rather hear about it than hear one song through an email. It's a lot better to hear about it through the public. Yeah, honestly, I I just, I won't take something from somebody just because from from my attorney, the stories he's told me, oh my gosh. But, But also, if it was like another writer who I knew or was highly referred, that's a little different, but just out of nowhere, it's just... Yeah. The PROs, they do a great job of it. Like, yeah. if you're at BMI, ASCAP, or CSAC, they'll refer you on to people and help set you up, and you can play a lot of shows in town, even if you're not a great singer. And honestly, that's how I got started, too. Like, somebody... I'd, I'd known somebody who had a publishing deal, and they re- recommended me to a publisher, and that's kind of how I... That's what I tell people. That Beth is the first person I met in Nashville. I went to straight to BMI... And met Beth and played some songs for her, and um, so I always tell everyone go to ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. Yeah. That that's like the best starting point ever. And, and they, then ten years right later, know everyone. So like, if there's someone great, they will call you and they'll say, "Hey, keep your eye on this artist. Exactly. You should know about." So be out and about. Use your connections. Make relationships. Oftentimes, those relationships will serve as a vetting process. Yeah. If you're working with one of their writers, or you happen to know them or meet them. Yeah. 
and they listen to your stuff and go, well, maybe this, that, and the other, you're getting great advice from people at the top. So that by the time it gets to a Beth or a Luke and they feel comfortable about listening, it's at the quality level that you want it to be. Don't sit in your little cubby hole and just be a genius to yourself. You got to get out. You got to share information. You got to do stuff. And keep creating. I think that was one thing at BMI. People would say, you know, I've written 10 songs I really love and I think I'm ready. And I was like, listen, people in Nashville are writing song a day. These songwriters are cranking out over 100 a year. And 98% of even what the highest level songwriters write aren't getting cut and you aren't hearing it. I mean, it is a mass amount that they are working in. Not everybody has to write that many songs, but you can't go meet a publisher and then a month later have the same songs because yeah. they're going to think you can't keep up. So if you can just keep creating, I think that's a big part of it is like, don't get stuck on like, well, now I have these and now I need to get them to artists. It's like, get out and about, but like, just keep being curious and keep creating and growing and evolving. I'd love to have your opinions. Um, but I think all these things we've been talking about today are not only applicable in the country space, but in all the music spaces. Um, I, I can't think of one thing that's just genre specific to country. If, if you're a rock guy, a hip hop guy, um, it, it, all these techniques apply to you. You might have to modify a couple of them, but don't you think? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Especially now. I mean, we work with yeah. it, it just because music, music with streaming and everything's become so international. I mean, we have we work with people all the time from L.A. or or London or I mean, I'm sure Ross is. I don't know. We both do trips to L.A. and work with pop artists. Which is like going to another country. Yeah. But that, that's another story. I, we live there. <laughs> kind of. But, but to your point, I mean, we actually in the last couple of weeks of the show, we've been talking about globalization. Yeah. And yeah. nobody works just in their little box. Yeah. You are, all you have to do is send a, hit send, send a file, yeah. and you can work all over the world. And there's opportunities for people. We we know people who are doing Chinese master classes with Chinese subtitles, and yeah. a lot of engineers in our space are traveling and doing classes and seminars all over the world. And producers and songwriters, you're working globally. Just think that way. You can, yeah. and also there's income globally right. too. Like you're you're not just looking for the record that works on radio in America. You don't know it could be sync. It could be who knows what it may be and where it can come from. So open up your head, because it's all in yeah. your computer. I'm working with this new mixing engineer. I've been sending him files, and uh, turns out the guy's in London. I had no idea. I thought he, he was no in idea. East Nashville. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I will tell you that on our mixing side, we do a lot of international mixes and yeah. stuff, and I people just want to get to Dave. Uh, by the way, you've got some songs out, right? Does your artist thing still inform you? Is that something that you still like to do? Yeah, it, it that, that fills up my soul. You know, I get... I spent the last 10 years kind of giving my songs and I just, uh, I still needed to scratch that itch. I think a lot of people start out as artists. I think we all are artists and we all, yeah, in some way, we've all found our path. And so I've just always wanted to keep that just for me. So stars on your side and we should yeah. plant a tree or the actual titles. <laughs> yeah. right. Thanks, okay. sir. So what advice would you but, give to our audience? Advice would just be to be a student of the game, to study it every day. Um, get to, get to get to one of the PROs and introduce yourself. Play, perform if you want to be a songwriter. Perform around town. If you want to be an engineer, then go go study with go find Reed Shippen or Justin Demake and stalk them until they give you an internship around town. Or this is just Nashville based, but that's, PROs that's, are performing rights organizations. ASCAP, wow. BMI, CSAC, stuff like that. So you know, if you want to be a producer, look at listen to a Dan Huff track and see what what instrumentation is he using. Where is he putting guitars in the mix? Why do his songs sound extra smash tastic versus other people that do the same song? I mean, he's just a master of balance and level, and um, just study who you love. I mean, honestly, I would just say. Um, kind of two things one which i already said before is stay a fan of music always you know being aware of what the new music is and then or and old music um but just remember kind of what what even made you sign up and come to nam luke you said but something, yeah just have fun you said something that uh is applicable here but i think it's also transcends into my world because i started doing it when i read it like four or five years ago and that's always keep in touch with your high school 
past and keep in touch with the debauchery you caused in college. You didn't quite say it that way, Luke. I was going to say, uh, I mean, I, I agree with that. But, but uh, uh, don't take, you know, don't take credit we for didn't it. know any better in high school. We didn't know any better in college. And I think that's a, a, a foundation for creativity to, to grow in. I, f I feel like that it's such a gift to get to be, to do music, whether it's for a living or not, because I know for me, every day I go into my call it a studio or writer room it basically looks like my bedroom did when i was 16 with <laughs> maybe just a little more money you know on the gear instead of just a boom box but but it's fun it's like just that that mystery of of getting to be creative and mm -hmm. going in with nothing and you never and then coming yeah. out with just something it's i'm just pretty so sure exciting. i'm pretty sure we all feel like we would have been a little farther along in maturity by this point in our lives don't you think <laughs> Yeah, but if we <laughs> mature too much, then it would probably, our art would suffer. That's one thing. If you're creative as a, like, literally your job is professional, it's like an excuse not to have to grow up. Hey, guys, it's not by accident that the most successful are often the most curious, the most passionate, and the most fearless. Uh, and in the case of the show you just watched, those folks also happen to be some of the nicest. Take those insights, add them to your journey, and create some special stuff for an audio. And we'll see you next week.